Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Shirley and I will be your moderator this evening. I am so excited to welcome Dr. August de Oliveira as our speaker tonight for a deep dive into the current state of 3D printing, resins and advancements, as well as how he leverages 3D printing in his practice to fabricate printed, printed aligners, crowns and digital dentures. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some quick housekeeping. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A box and we will answer them live at the end of the presentation. CE is not available for this webinar tonight. Dr. De Oliveira, thank you so much. Welcome and um, thank you for being with us here tonight. I will pass it over to you now. Cool. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, I am August. Um, if you've been watching Shine's webinars, I've done a number of them on 3D printing. So it seems to be a topic that isn't boring. Um, and the state of 3D printing these days is really far from boring. Um, I started 3D printing about 2014-ish. Um, and it's interesting. Um, I lecture on a couple of different things, but one of the things that I've always lectured on was guided implant surgery. And if you've ever gotten a surgical guide, chances are it's probably 3D printed. And I remember during one of my 2014 lectures, introducing a couple of slides on 3D printing and saying how cool it was. And um, I remember a doc came up to me afterwards and said, well, what's so cool about 3D printing? And I'm like, oh my God, you can print surgical guides and models. And he just looked at me with this blank stare and he's like, well, why is that cool? Well, true. <laughs> Back in the day, there wasn't a lot of things you can 3D print. Um, nowadays, we have about four 3D printers in the office that are going nonstop. And there are so many things you can 3D print. Um, as mentioned before, you know, we print our own in-office in aligners, we print dentures, we print crowns and lays and onlays, uh, but there's a lot of other things we can print. So the way that I did this lecture was, um, one of the things that I print on sort of a daily basis in my office? And um, I remember I met a doc um, who built this beautiful Taj Mahal dental office. It was so nice. And, and I love this guy. He's just like a neat freak dentist. And he said, you know, I'm going to build a new office and I don't want any stone. And so he wanted me to show him how to do 3D printing. So I always tell everyone, um, if you can currently make something in plastic or currently make it in stone, um, you can 3D print it. And so I'm going to show you all sorts of really cool things that we do. Um, if you don't know who I am, I am August de Oliveira. I'm a general dentist. Um, I practice in Los Angeles. Um, I have sort of learned implants uh, during my GPR, so most of what I teach is implant related. Um, wrote a couple of books, uh, uh, mostly on implants and 3D printing. And I'm kind of OG digital. Um, so I got my uh, first CIREC machine back in 2004. And one thing that was really interesting and sort of what got me into 3D printing is everyone calls everything these days 3D, right? 3D crowns with CIREC, you know, you've got a comb beam and you can see the patient's skull in 3D. But is it really 3D? It's kind of not, to be honest with you. We have this 3D model trapped behind a screen. And so when I bought my first 3D printer, my first printer was a Form uh, 2 from Form Labs. It was so wild to get this thing that was caught behind a screen in my hand. Like I could pick it up and we can look at it. And so I think that if you've never 3D printed before and then all of a sudden you are 3D printing, um, it'll just blow your mind. And so again, there isn't a day that our 3D printer isn't churning out something. Um, one thing uh, about what I'm doing these days is I'm the West Coast Director of the Mod Institute West. If you're not familiar with the Mod Institute, uh, we pretty much just teach 3D printing. Uh, and we've got a bunch of different courses. Uh, if you want to check it out, go to themodinstitute.com. 
And a fun fact about me, um, I figured I needed a hobby. Um, so I took up uh, sort of game development. Um, so I'm a Uni Unity certified game designer. And I do a lot of stuff with VR and AR and hopefully uh, can introduce that into dentistry. So interesting thing about 3D printing, and if you want to get down to the basics of 3D printing, we all 3D print every day in our dental office. If you do a composite, um, you're basically doing the same thing as a 3D printer. You're building up some object, usually in the patient's mouth, with layers and layers of flowable composite. And this is a time lapse of what a 3D printer is. So in a nutshell, we take a vat of flowable composite, and just like in the mouth, we use a UV light to build an object up layer by layer. So let's go through the process of what 3D printing is. So if you want to get into 3D printing, you should probably take a few steps back. And the first thing you're gonna need is a intraoral scanner. Um, there's lots of different numbers out there. Some people are saying it's like 40 or 50% of all dentists have an intraoral scanner. Um, I think it's more of like the 30% range. Um, but you really can't 3D print unless you have an intraoral scanner. Um, I know Shine has all sorts of different scanners that they use. Um, in my office, I have a Trios 3 and I have a Prime Scan by Dentsply Serona. Um, there's lots and lots of different scanners on the market and depending on what you want to do, uh, will sort of determine, but gosh, you know, I got into 3D scanning where a CIREC machine was 150 to $180,000. Um, these days you can get a scanner for, you know, under 25,000. That's a pretty awesome scanner. So the first thing you're going to do is scan something. So take an intraoral scan, take a comb beam scan. Um, you're just scanning something. And then you've got to say to yourself, well, what do I want to do with this scan, right? Am I going to be making an aligner? Am I going to be making a surgical guide, a denture, or a crown? So you usually use some type of software to modify it. Now, there's great software out there like ExoCAD and 3Shape. Um, that allow you to make crowns, dentures, night guards, and whatever. But there's also a lot of free software out there. So uh, we'll talk about designers and getting designs or learning how to design. Um, but if you, you know, uh, are just tipping your toe into the world of 3D printing, um, you know, there's so many good designers out there that will design for you for not a lot of money. Finally, we 3D print, and so I'll go over what's involved in the action of 3D printing. And then you got to do something with the 3D print that you have. And if you're not familiar with the 3D printing process, basically, we have this object that we printed out of this gooey mass of resin. And when it comes out of the 3D printer, it's pretty gross. It's, you know, dripping in this toxic goo. And even if you get the toxic goo off of it, um, we know from regular conventional composites is that oxygen inhibits the set of composites. So there's an air inhibited layer. So we have to remove that air inhibited layer. And we do so by washing in isopropyl alcohol. Now I'll tell you, you know, when we started 3D printing back in the day, you just basically bought a 3D printer and you got to figure out how to wash it. And we'll talk about post curing too. So we would put stuff in baggies of alcohol and put in the ultrasonic. We would use uh, nail cures like in the nail salon. Um, but a lot of companies are realizing that one, dentists want a pretty easy solution. But two, it has to be an FDA approved object. Right. If we're going to be doing a crown that's going into a patient's mouth, it has to be printed a certain way. You know, enough light has to be delivered to that object for a certain amount of time. It has to be washed a certain way so that toxic goo is not on it. And it has to be post cured for a certain amount of time. So whether you buy a sprint ray printer or a form labs printer or a desktop metal printer, um, 
a lot of these companies make these accompanying wash and cure stations. So I'm gonna be focusing mainly on the Sprint Ray Pro S line of printers. Uh, we can talk about what the different ones are, but their wash and cure station, I gotta tell you is the best I've played with. Um, so I currently have a Sprint Ray Pro um, S wash station. Um, typically takes about 10 minutes or so to wash your models. But the cool thing about it is if you look on the upper right of the screen where it says print, you see two metal objects with some printed stuff on it. So those things are called the build flake. And so the name of the game in keeping 3D printing not gross is to not have to touch the models. So what you just do is take that build plate out of the printer, stick it in the wash station and push a button. You don't have to touch the model. And then after it's washed and dried, we have to post cure it. So the models that come out of our printer are probably about 90% hardened, but they're still not fully cured. And so after about 10 minutes in the wash, it takes about five to 10 minutes of post curing. Now, we've got to finish it. And this is a beautiful denture uh, done by my buddy, Dr. Wally Rene of Mod East. Um, so if it's a simple model, you knock it off the build plate and you're good to go. But if you're doing a denture or a crown, um, there is some uh, degree of finishing. And we'll talk about how we do that. So, Let's talk about what a printer is. So let's say you don't have a printer, right? And you want to buy a printer. And so you should probably know a little bit about the terminology in printers. So all printers have a UV protective cover. Most of them are sort of a somewhat translucent plastic, um, just like those little things that we're supposed to hold uh, in front of the curing light when we cure, but I tend to not and just stare at the light. Um, some have a completely opaque cover, like it's totally, totally made out of metal. Um, and the goal is just to keep light from leaking in. We've got these buckets or resin vats um, that hold our flowable composite. And if we have any light get into there, it's going to kind of harden it. And so the resin vat is where the flowable composite goes. And kind of a pro tip in 3D printing, if you get into 3D printing, you're going to have a bunch of different types of resins you use, right? You're going to have one for crowns, you're going to have one for surgical guides, and one for models. So um, what you want to do is just buy a bunch of these resin vats, keep them filled up with resin, put them in a light protective cover that kind of comes with it, and just swap them out. Um, when you're looking at a 3D printer. And this is kind of my pet peeve these days. When we started 3D printing, um, you know, the cost of 3D printers were a little bit um, kind of lower than they are now. Um, but even then, there was a lot of these sort of hobby 3D printers that you could buy from Amazon. And um, you can still do it, uh, frozen, any cubic. Um, and a lot of those printers don't have a very powerful computer at the front of them. Um, and as a result, you've got to be kind of a computer whiz to sort of make these things work. Um, so one thing that I do like about the newer printers, especially the Sprint Ray line of printers, is they have this computer that's sort of cloud enabled. And so all the software updates kind of get in there. You can save models in case you have a failed print. You can just hit print again. Um, if you're working on the cloud, if you have a designer, that's designing stuff, they can even set it up and send it to your printer um, so that you don't have to kind of deal with it. But one question I get asked a lot is, well, what type of printer should I buy? So there's really, um, Sprint Ray has two types of printers. And, and if you look at different brands, there's really sort of two types of printers. And before we talk about that, we should just take a little step back and talk a little bit about the build plate. So if you look in the bottom right hand side of the screen, you're going to see kind of a big one that's got a bunch of denture bases on it and a small one that has like a little denture and a hybrid on it. 
Um, so if you were ever a kid and played with a flashlight or now you got an iPhone, so you don't need a flashlight. And if you took the flashlight and pointed it to a wall, you would see kind of a big sort of rough beam, right? And then as you walk towards the wall with your flashlight, what happens to that beam? It gets more and more concentrated and defined, but it's a smaller beam, right? So there's a bunch of printers that print at around 100 microns, meaning the smallest thing it can visualize is 100 microns. And then they got a bunch of printers out there that can print in the 55 to 65 micron range. As a result, that beam is smaller and the build plate smaller. So in the Sprint Ray line of printers, they've got a 95 and a 55. And all that means is the smallest thing a 95 printer can print is 95 microns. And the smallest thing that you can print on the 55 is 55 microns. So if you use that, that rationale, you're like, well, hell, I want the 55, right? I want something that gives me the most detail. Well, here's the deal. It's kind of overkill for most things. So if you're doing a lot of crown and bridge, if you're doing a lot of implant model work, you're doing stuff on tie bases, you want to do screw king crowns, you do a lot of hybrids, then I would recommend the 55. The drawback is you're not going to be able to print a lot of stuff, right? Maybe one or two things at a time. Whereas if you want to do dentures, aligners, surgical guides, smile design stuff, um, then you're going to be better off with the 95 micron printer. Um, and people say, well, I do all that stuff, but I kind of want to do everything. Well, I tell people get the 95 micron printer first and see if you are really into 3D printing. I think that everyone that adopts 3D printing into their practice and takes off with it. And look, you know, I love chairside milling. And I've got friends who've tried chairside milling and they say they hate it. So, you know, buy the 95 printer first. And if you just love 3D printing and use 3D printing all the time, you're gonna need a second printer. And as a second printer, go ahead and get the 55 micron printer. So um, what I want to do is uh, throughout the rest of the lecture, I'm just going to talk about things that I do all the time, but more importantly, talk about the return on investment, right? If you've been into technology or like technology in your office, there's nothing suckier than buying some expensive mill or laser or whatever, and you don't use it right? You don't use it or you use it sparingly. And then you look at the increase in, our, uh, in either income or savings in your office versus what the monthly payment is. And so like I bought every single laser um, and I just sucked at it. I mean, I'm sure a lot of my friends that were really good at it just love lasers. And I would have this $2,000 a month payment and maybe I would do like a filling a month on it. And so it just wasn't giving me the ROI I wanted. So I bought my first uh, 3D printer just to print surgical guides. And I was spending about $375 a surgical guide. And I was doing about 10 surgical guides a month in my office. And so I thought, well, a 3D printer at the time, the Form 2 printer was $3,500. And so I could save you know, probably about at least 300 out of the 375 by printing it and making it myself. And so that ROI was easy. But the funny thing is the biggest ROI I've ever gotten in dentistry um, is making our own aligners. I say 3D printing aligners um, and people get all excited. You don't actually 3D print the aligner. So what you do with an aligner, is you scan your patient, you take your x-rays, you take your photos, and you send it to a service just like Invisalign or ClearCorrect. And then what they'll do is they give you a quote unquote clean check. 
that you approve. And then instead of making the aligner, you make them by three printing models at different stages. And then, um, so you use something like a pressure former. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to use that little buffalo vacuum former that we make uh, bleaching trays out of. No. And so if you do want to make your own aligners, you're going to want to have a pressure former. And a pressure former is different than a vacuum former because a pressure, a vacuum former just sucks from below your model. And what you need is something that has suction below it and pressure on the top. And so I really like the Drupamet. Um, it's made by Densply Serona. Um, we also use uh, sheets. So we pressure form our, we got our 3D printed model. We pressure form different size sheets. And um, for an aligner, you're gonna want to use a 0.7 millimeter Essex Ace sheet. So a fun fact, everyone thinks that Invisalign invented aligners. Um, they really didn't. Um, a company called Essex uh, did it back in the day, and it was pretty barbaric. They would basically take a stone model, use a little hacksaw on it, set the teeth in wax, take alginates, and pour up different stages of the aligner and make the aligners. So Essex has always, always had a line of aligner sheets. So we buy the Essex Ace brand. So for our regular aligners, we use the 0.7 millimeters. For our retainers, we use the one millimeter sheet. And for the attachment templates, we use a half a millimeter sheet. And then uh, the way that we do it is um, we just cut it off the model. So you can try to pry it off. Um, what we typically do is just take a diamond disc. It's pressure formed on the 3D printed model. We just cut around with our diamond disc. And then we use these scotch Brite polishers to do it. Um, and then the rest of it is all just like you've been doing forever with Invisalign. There's IBR, there's attachments, they tell you what to do. But the coolest thing about this is that we were spending probably close to, what, $1,900 a case for Invisalign. And between the service that we use, we use a company called Exceed Ortho. Um, and there's tons of different ones. Dentswise, Serona has a company. Sprint Ray has a company. Everyone and their brother these days has an aligner company. Um, but we like Exceed Ortho. Um, it costs about $270 to get the ClinCheck and to get the models. And then, you know, what we do is we just make three sets of aligners at the time. A lot of people tell me, they're like, well, I scan the patient and I send it to Invisalign and they give me like 40 aligners. So it's going to really suck to print all these models and make 40 sets of aligners. Well, don't do that. I mean, that's dumb. I don't even know why Invisalign does that. Uh, what you want to do is just print three sets at a time. Because what if you need a refinement? Or what if you need a mid-course correction? And so we just have these little lab bins out. And whenever there's downtime in our office, or if one assistant is helping me, the other assistant can work on aligners. And the assistants make the aligners. So for me as a dentist, it doesn't feel any different than using Invisalign or ClearCorrect. Um, I don't see any difference in the number of refinements I do or mid-course corrections. I will say, and this seems anecdotal, that I have less refinements uh, making my own 3D printing. Um, and the only reason why is I think Exceed Ortho, the company I use to do the design, they are attachment happy. I got to tell them to chill on the attachments. They put attachments on every tooth that they could. Um, so if you use a lot of attachments, um, they tend to move the teeth better. But anyways, that's basically it. So uh, send it in to a company like Exceed Ortho, 3D print the models, um, use a pressure former, cut it out, um, use scotch Bright polishers. And by the way, you can order these scotch Bright polishers from Shine. Um, as well as all the different uh, um, Invisalign sheets, and uh, you're good to go. So one other thing that, that I found was a really kind of save your butt kind of thing. So I don't do bracketed ortho in my practice a lot. 
But what I do do is I start the patient on aligners and then, um, you know, you get to the end and there's just that lateral that won't come down or that canine that just won't twist. So I've been doing these really cool indirect bracket trays. So you send in, again, I use Exceed Ortho, um, Great Lakes Ortho works with them, um, but you can use Serona, Sure Smile, and um, all these different companies. But you just scan the patient, send it in. They send you a clin check uh, with the brackets. You tell them which brackets you want to use. Um, you can either um, make your own tray or they can make the tray for you. Uh, but you can 3D print um, the indirect bracket tray. Um, this is uh, a Sprint Ray's indirect bracket tray material. It's kind of a rubber and just snap the brackets in. Patient comes in, uh, you know, in this case here, we use 3M Transbond Plus. Um, you know, we mark the midline because I am an idiot. <laughs> it's easier to mark it outside the mouth. Um, and then you just go ahead and put it on and peel off. In this case, we use ceramic brackets. And in about three months, we were able to kind of get this patient back. Uh, this was a kid um, who we did Invisalign on and just did not wear their retainers. And so the mom was like, he is not going through Invisalign again. You got to do something. And so we were able to kind of correct for all those uh, rotations uh, with 3D printing. So surgical guides are another big bang for your buck. And again, um, you know, uh, if you're placing implants, uh, it's funny. Um, I got into to surgical guides back in the day because I just wasn't really all that good. Uh, at implants, you know, I would put them in and they would be kind of tipped and they wouldn't be perfect. Um, and so I said, you know what, I'm going to use surgical guides as my crutch to allow me to do it. And it's funny for, for about five or six years, every single case I did was guided. And then, you know, with anything in dentistry, I think you get kind of cocky after a while. And I'm like, well, you know, I'll do the singles freehand, but then I'll just use guided for other stuff. And these patients would come back to get their stuff uh, restored. And I'm like, God, this is hard. So I've gone back to being almost 100% guided. I mean, maybe an immediate molar I'll do without a guide. But for the most part, most of my stuff is done guided. So let's take a look at this case. So this is a great case to show 3D printing. When we deal in the posterior, it's pretty easy to get a screw retained crown, right? And so, uh, but we typically don't temporize on the posterior. In the anterior, I find it's kind of hard um, just because that pre-maxilla or the anterior mandible tends to be tipped out to the facial a bit. And if you line your implant up with where the bone is, a lot of the times that screw hole is coming out the facial. So I know it's kind of a small picture, but if you look at my sort of planned implant, you'll see a little yellow pole coming out of the buckle and that's exiting out the facial. So I designed this, um, I use a software called Blue Sky Plan. Um, and the design I think was about $15 uh, for the export of the surgical guide. And so we went ahead and did our surgery super, super easy. Um, cool thing about this is you can do this while the patient's waiting. Right. So if a patient um, needs, you know, a posterior implant, it's okay. You can scan them. They're not going to wait around uh, for an hour or so for you to make a guide. But if someone breaks a front tooth and you can not really promise them a, a tooth, a temporary that day, because I never promise any immediate patient that we're going to for sure be able to put a temporary on, but they'll wait around. And so this patient, uh, she had a post in number eight. Um, fractured root. Um, she wanted her tooth a ASAP. So we went ahead and printed the surgical guide. She waited. It took us about an hour between scanning her with the intraoral scanner and the comb beam. And then uh, we went ahead and placed the implant. So look at where my scan body is. Okay, so this is an implant direct uh, legacy implant, and I'm using the implant direct smart base tie base. Um, but check this out. So the implant placement is not terrible, um, but you can see from the direction of the scan body 
that there's just no way we're going to do this um, without a hole coming out the facial. So you can either, one, live with the fact that you got a hole coming out the facial and patch up with a composite. Usually you can do a pretty good job of it. Um, or you can use an angled screw channel. And one thing that's really interesting, um, being a Syrac user, and I know there's a lot of um, Emerald users out there as well, um, if those types of mills, these typical chair side mills, are what are called four axis mills. And four axis mills can only drill one hole, right? So if you're doing an implant restoration on a tie base, you only get one hole, and that's the hole that the tie base fits in. But the screw hole has to be coming at, you know, parallel to that hole. So one thing that's really cool about 3D printing is it doesn't really care where holes are. And so we can have a hole for our tie base, but then we can have an angled hole for our screw. And so in this case here, I used an angled uh, screw channel tie base. And so you can see here, we were able to move that screw hole from coming out the facial to be coming out the lingual. And so you can see here, we have a special screwdriver or hex tool if you wanna be you know, proper. Um, and one thing that's interesting about these angled screw channeled screw screwdrivers um, is that ball end. And you gotta be real careful to make sure that that ball is really in the screw because it's easy to strip these guys. But uh, here's our temporary um, that we printed. And what I just love about this workflow is that you know we place an implant, right? We're doing an immediate implant. We're pulling a tooth and we're putting the sacred screw in that hole, right? You can't touch it. Right, nothing can touch it. Um, but what if we were making a temporary using conventional bisacrylic resin or acrylic or whatever? What would we do? We would stick our implant in, we would put some bone graft around it, we would take a pre-op impression, fill it up with the Luxatem, and then shove it onto that above it. Well, where's all that composite going? It's going down and touching the implant. So this workflow, everything was done outside of the mouth. And so there's no cement, there's no resin touching the implant. And so it's really easy to get pretty decent temporaries with it. Okay, so night guards. Um, night guards are really interesting and night guards have really come a long way. Um, with our newer resins uh, that we have with 3D printing, their uh, pro physical properties are very similar to PMMA. So back in the day when I started, uh, a lot of companies came out with night guard materials that were really, really weak, and the patient would just tear them up. And so now these night guard materials are great. And what I love about it is a lot of times, most of the time in my office, we're doing night guards because people are bruxers and they're grinding their teeth, but they don't really have pain. Um, and it's usually the clenchers that have the pain. Um, and so a patient comes in, they're in a ton of pain and you're like, well, yeah, let me just take an impression and uh, let you wallow in agony for two to three weeks while we get our night guard. You can do AI night guards now where the computer designs them and you can print them and you're done in about 45 minutes. So the first thing you wanna do is scan the patient with their bite open. And if you're like an occlusion guru, uh, there's probably a better way of doing it than what I do. But what I basically want is the patient to be about three millimeters open um, in the anterior. So I use a leaf gauge. You can buy these uh, from Shine. I scan the patient. There's lots of different services uh, that give you night guards. There's free software out there. Blue Sky, True Abutment all has free software. Um, you can use Sprint Ray AI design services that will design it on the fly. Um, you can design it yourself in ExoCAD or 3Shape. So there's tons and tons of ways of designing the night card. And I got to be honest with you, designing night cards does not take a lot of time. It's not like a crown. And then we just print them out. The cool thing about this is 
how many patients do you have that say you make them a night guard and they're like, oh, my dog ate my night guard. And then they want you to like make another night guard for free for them because their dog ate it. Well, you can print out a bunch of night guards and give one to the dog. And so the dog can have its own night guard. Um, you know, or the patient loses their night guard or, you know, it cracks. Um, you've got this STL model in the cloud forever. And so what we typically do is we print out like three or four night guards. It's like buy one, get four free night guards. And then you just adjust the occlusion and they're good to go. So cosmetic dentistry and, um, the new composites that have been coming out in the printing world really have made 3D printing um, just sort of an integral part of what I do. Um, and I'm in no way, shape, or form a cosmetic dentist. But one of my biggest pet peeves was, okay, I've got a big case. I send out for a night guard, or I mean, send out for a wax up. I make a Luxa temp, uh, temporary off the wax up. And then I sent, the patient says, God, I love the temporaries. And then you send the case to the lab and the final doesn't look like the temporaries you made. So one of the easiest ways that we can use 3D printing is from wax ups. But if the lab designer or yourself is using ExoCAD, you can actually use the same design for your finals. So here's a patient, a bunch of old composites. And uh, she needed an implant on 11 and just had no bone in there. So we ended up doing a wax up. Uh, we made a putty wash matrix off a 3D printed model and made her temporaries. And she's like, yeah, I like them. Um, I kind of think the teeth are a little wide in the front and I want them a little wider. Okay. So the same lab that did the design did the finals, made them wider um, and maybe made the laterals a little bit more pronounced. And she was good to go. So it was just very predictable going from the wax up to the final and not sort of this back and forth. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I got into it on, if you follow me on Facebook, I tend to uh, have some interesting folks commenting um, on my cases. And um, I got into it with this lab guy that was like poo-pooing the use of 3D printed wax ups. And I couldn't understand why the lab guy was so mad about it. I mean, because the lab guy's got to design the case and how sucky is it for the lab guy to like do 10 Emacs crowns and you open up the box and go, God, I hate it. You know, well, do the design first, have the dentist make temporaries from your design um, and have the patient wear it. And the patient will say, God, I love it. So before the lab person even makes the case, you basically have approval from the patient. And so I think that's a, just a great way to do stuff. Now, one thing that's out now, which is a bit controversial, um, are the use of permanent crown resins. So these are FDA cleared materials that are FDA approved to be used as permanent restorations. And if you're an old timer like me, um, you get a little gun shy sometimes, right? When, when things are new and you're like, well, okay, I tried Sculpture Fiber Pour or Symphony or Tarja Spectris, which were um, resins, lab made resins that didn't really work. And so um, there's, you know, a push to, be cool and new and uh, do air, all these permanent restorations. And I gotta tell you, I, I do some, um, but I do mill a lot. But one thing I found, which just is the coolest application of these resins is caries control, right? So I got this patient, she's in her nineties. She's actually 97 and she's totally with it. But uh, she's got a lot of decay. She's got some abscesses and, um, you know, working with her and her daughter. And, you know, I first looked at her and I'm like, you know what, we need to get all these teeth out and we need to do upper and lower dentures. But the problem with her is she's got a huge palatal tori and two huge mandibular tori. 
And so she's, you know, she's healthy, but going through that surgery of removing the tori um, is just kind of not worth it. So I'm like, God, I don't know what to do. And then um, my hygienist <laughs> talked the mom in, or the, the daughter and said, hey, you know, why don't we just do a bunch of composites without really talking to me about it? And because I'm like, I'm the one that's going to have to do the composites. And so she said, hey, well, you know, can you do a bunch of composites? And I'm like, yeah, but it's going to be really hard. I mean, by the time you remove all this interproximal decay, all this root decay, I mean, the teeth will just look like apple cores. So I said, how about this? It's going to take me like hours and hours to do direct composite on these teeth. Why don't I just charge you for a five surface composite and do this in the crown resin? And so uh, went ahead and did the design. It took like 15 minutes to design this, it took no time at all. Um, and uh, prepped the teeth. Uh, we printed them out. We can print, you know, about up to about eight units in about 15 minutes with a crown kit. So pretty amazing. If I tried to mill eight units, I would be milling for like four hours. And so we printed them out and boom, this is two hours. And so I can tell you, are the crowns a little opaque? Yeah, they're a little bit opaque, but she's got a bunch of PFMs in the posterior. And I guarantee you, I'm sure there's some style Italiano people out here that can do a better composite than I can. But if I try to do composite on those teeth, um, they would not look this good. And so this is just a great way where you have a patient with just yuck mouth and you just want to get all the decay out and not spend a lot of time with these root caries um, situations. Um, these resins are great. And so this is Sprint Race Ceramic Crown Resin. And again, it is FDA cleared to be used as a permanent crown resin. So uh, another thing that they're great for um, is quadrant dentistry. So I've got a syrup. And for me uh, to mill out an onlay will take me probably with prep time and scanning, take me about an hour. Um, for me to do an MOD composite, eh, it probably take me about, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes. So this patient came in, um, there's interproximal decay uh, between two, three, and four. Um, you know, she's got that decay on the lingual, so it's kind of debat debatable, like, you know, do I do an onlay or a really big composite? And so if I have you know, a DOL on two, an MODL on three, and a DO, this turned out to be like a DOL on four, and I try to use all those rings, it's going to be really hard to get really decent contacts. So this patient came in, she also needed crowns on 30 and 31. And so we scanned her, uh, ExoCAD designing inlays and onlays in ExoCAD, I mean, there's really nothing for you to do. Just basically clean up the contacts and you're good to go. And so what, what I did was I milled out 30 and 31, and this is in the uh, GC Lisi material. It's a lithium silicate material. And then I printed and designed the uppers while those two were being milled. Um, and you can see the opacity of the inlays and onlays is about the same radio opacity as lithium disilicate. Um, and this was great. I was done in two hours. And so we basically did, you know, five T. And it was a great use of time. Um, patient loved it. Um, you know, they, they got all their work done, uh, busy, busy doctor patient. So this is kind of controversial too. So if 3D printing is so great, uh, what about a single DO, right? And so one could argue that it's not a good use of chair time, right? So, you know, I can do a, this DO in probably about a half an hour in my office, but it took me about an hour, hour and 15 minutes to 3D print it. So one other benefit we get from 3D printed resin um, is it doesn't grip onto the tooth and shrink. 
right? So yeah, we layer our composites and we use flowable and paste and all that good stuff. But we still, as that resin shrinks, it does develop some degree of cracking and crazing within the enamel around it. And you can look at the blue tooth on the left, that's a direct composite, and the two green teeth on the right with very little enamel stress are either milled or printed inlays. So if you have a problem with sensitivity um, or you just don't like those rings and you know trying to get a good contact, um, 3D printing is really the way to go. So again, in ExoCAD, there's no design time on an inlay. And I got a really nice broad contact, which I would probably have to kind of fumble with. It's kind of hard to see uh, in the initial picture, but basically we have recurrent decay that's more on the lingual um, on this cracked filling the patient had. So for me to get a big wide contact like that with rings, I could do it. It just wouldn't be easy to do. So another cool thing that I found recently um, is what happens when you have a patient, um, either you place an implant or you're just extracted and you're grafting it and the patient needs a tooth, right? So, um, you know, this case, it was a very vain person with number three missing and she didn't want to be with, or he didn't want to be without number three. Um, but what about number eight? So like, what do you do? So what we would do is we would stress ourselves out we would take a pre-op impression, pour it up in stone, you know, make an Essex retainer while the patient waited after we extracted the tooth. And the patient would be in the dental chair for like two hours. Um, and we would give them an Essex retainer while we waited for a flipper. And so now what we do is we just 3D print the flipper. It's probably the easiest thing that you can design in ExoCAD. And so we just scan the patient, we just design this flipper. We 3D print all in one color. So the best material that I have found uh, for printing flippers um, is Sprint Ray's Onyx Tough material. Um, the drawback is it's really, really white. It's like toilet bowl white. Um, I think they call it Hollywood white. It's so white. Um, so you really have to stain it. Um, and so in this case here, I um, actually printed this with our crown resin material um, that we made crowns out of an A3. And then I used a product called OpiGlaze to paint on the pink. And then we put a little staining in the tube. But snap right in, just like a flipper. Uh, patient had it the same day. Um, you can even make them ahead of time uh, for the patient. So it's pretty easy to do. And uh, I don't know if you can kind of hear his snap, but he's just going to snap that in there and snap it right in. And so they these fit just like your flippers. I mean, it's the same physics involved. So one hot topic uh, these days is 3D printed dentures. And there's three ways that you can print a denture. And look, when 3D printed dentures first came out, the resins we had just really sucked. <laughs> they were really ugly denture resins. And now we've got so many good options for dentures um, that it's really making dentures fun again. I mean, I never thought dentures were fun. Um, I thought they were pretty terrible, actually. Um, but now I don't have such a problem with it. So one way you can do it is you can 3D print the denture base and then use those teeth that come on cards, so like carded teeth, um, and glue them in. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the best ways to make a denture. Um, the problem is, is you need a really big VDO, right? And so if the patient's really got resort bridges and you really are opening them up, it's pretty easy to glue in those teeth. But for the most part, uh, you got to adjust the teeth to get them to fit in, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. So I don't really do these. Um, what I do most of the time is print the denture as one piece and paint on the gums. And so this is probably the uh, strongest uh, 3D printed denture out there. Um, but one thing that wasn't popular back in the day and is gaining popularity again with these newer resins is printing the denture in two pieces. So printing the denture base, then gluing the teeth in, and then maybe characterizing the gums just a little bit afterwards. And so before you do that, you should ask yourself, well, how do I scan for a denture? 
And so one of the first things you want to do is, look, if the patient has no teeth at all, um, then you're probably better off taking an alginate, getting uh, wax rims, and just doing it the old-fashioned way. Um, Dr. Wally Rene uh, from the Mod Institute has a really great way of doing it, and he does a lot more dentures than I do. Um, but what I just do is I take the patient's denture, right? They walk in with their denture. It's either broken or they don't like it. And then I border mold, take a border molded impression inside the patient's denture, right? So what do you have when you have the patient's denture? Well, you got two things, right? You've got a custom tray and you've got an occlusal ring because the patient's already got their vertical from their old denture and they already have the intaglio of the denture to serve as a custom tray. So what I just do is do all the border molding in the patient's denture in their mouth, upper and lower at the same time. And then I take the denture out in my hand and I scan it. So I'm using a prime scan right here to do it. Then what I do is I make sure the impression material is cut away from the teeth, right? So I can see the teeth. And then I put the dentures back in the patient's mouth and then I scan the bite in the patient's mouth. So this is really awesome, right? I just skipped two steps, right? I skipped, or three steps really. So I skipped my alginate to get an occlusal rim in a custom tray. I skipped my occlusal rim. I skipped my custom tray. And now I'm good to go just to make the denture. And so in this case here, I did a denture design. Um, the True Abutment Company has a free AI uh, denture design service. It's absolutely free. It's called Dentru. And then we just remove the supports on the denture. And then we just sort of paint on the patient's gums. Um, so this cost me nothing for design. It cost me about 20 bucks in resin. And the cool thing about these dentures is patient loses them, patient breaks them. We still we have the design in the cloud. We can just print out another one. All right. So I tell you what, I'm going to actually stop it here and not talk too much about stackable guides or hybrids. And let's go ahead and go into the Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see. Thank you so much, doctor. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And yeah, uh, we're going to, that was fascinating. Um, so much information. We, I know that there are some questions out there. So I'm going to go ahead and give you, give our listeners a few moments to type in any questions that you might have um, so that we could get uh, Dr. De Oliveira answering them. And we have one so far from Dr. Nick Tanner. What okay. are you cementing those with? Uh, cementing the inlays and onlays. Um, so I'll just tell you all the cements I use. So um, I actually like Maxim Elite. I know there's some, you know, she she dentists that uh, poo poo on Kerr products, but I use um, Optibon Solo Plus. I etch the enamel, and then I use uh, their uh, I don't know self etching one if it's a vital tooth on the dentin, um, and then I use Maxim Elite. Um, kind of a pro tip uh, if you're doing any sort of composite bonding is there's a product, I believe Shine carries it, called Blue Sep, um, uh, B-L-U and then S-E-P. Um, I paint that on the sides of any restoration I do, whether it's ceramic or composite, and it keeps the cement from locking in interproximally. And then, you know, cement it in, uh, cure it, and then I finish my margins either with a, I start out with a softlex disc, and then I use either stones or Ivoclar polishers. Um, if I'm cementing to a tie base, um, I do like uh, Ivoclar's um, um, multi-link hybrid abutment cement. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, and the reason why I like it is it's very, very opaque. So if you looked at the tie base I used from Implant Direct, one thing that's really cool about that tie base is that it's anodized. Um, so um, you can kind of, you know, it's purple in the gum area and it's gold in sort of the inside of the tooth. Um, but even then that sort of does show through. So the opacity of the multi-link hybrid abutment cement really masks that out. 
Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Donna Pitts. Could you go over dentures again in the acrylic used? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you want me to just uh, kind of just pull up my presentation mm -hmm. and just show you those slides again? So let me just go back to sharing the screen. Um, or I'll just go ahead and scroll through here. So um, can everyone see it? I'm, I'm not going to go full screen so I can still see the chat. Um, but basically, there's two ways, two good ways to do it, right? So in the middle where it says printed monolithic, so you're going to use a composite resin. And that really depends on the printer you have. And so if you're using a sprint ray, you got two choices. So one is called OnX. Um, it's actually designed for hybrids, but we use it for dentures. And so those come in different shades, A1, A2, A3. But they just came out with a new one called High Impact Denture Resin, and it's it's better. So you're going to want to use the high impact stuff. And the cool thing about the high impact is there's a lot more shade options. And so that's to do monolithic. So monolithic, you're printing an A1, A2, or A3, and you're painting the gum or printing or painting the gums on it. So when you do a two piece denture, right? you're gonna print the base in the base material. And so Sprint Ray has the high impact denture base material. Uh, it's Meharry, they have dark pink and light pink. I think there's three shades, maybe four shades. And then again, the teeth are the same teeth you would use for the monolithic. So they come in A1, A2, and A3. Um, I'm sorry, uh, did she ask if uh, to go over the steps or just the resins? I, it looks like it was, could you go over dentures again and the acrylic used? So yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it sounded steps. like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's go over the steps. So um, this is uh, kind of the biggie. And let me actually hit play so you guys can see the video again. So patient comes in, right? And so, so the example that I'm giving is patients got a set of dentures, right? They got a crappy set of dentures, but they got a set of dentures, right? And so if you have a set of dentures, what do you got? You've got a custom tray and you've got an occlusal ring because you've got the patient's upper and you've got the patient's lower and they're at least chewing something. You know, you kind of have a midline. It might be wrong, but you have a midline. Um, and so take that, you know, paint some tray adhesive in it. Don't paint a lot of tray adhesive, by the way, but paint a little bit of tray adhesive in it. Take some heavy body impression material. So I use take one. Again, I'm a Kerr guy. Um, I use take one impression material, heavy body. And so fill it up with heavy body, go through all your border molding steps with the heavy body. If you see any area that's showing through, use an acrylic burr and then kind of take those out and then do a wash. And so I'm using take one light body and doing a wash, right? This is impressions. I'm taking an actual impression in the patient's mouth and then pop them out take your scanner. So it doesn't have to be a prime scan. It can be a trios or whatever scanner you use. And you're going to scan the intaglio of that. You also want to scan the sides of, of the impression. So you have some teeth to match up stuff with. And then what you want to do is stick those dentures back in the patient's mouth with the impression material. And you're going to do your buckle bite in the patient's mouth, right? So you got to make sure that the impression material is not covering all the teeth, right? Cut away some of that impression material. But then you've got your custom tray that you scanned and you've got your occlusal rim that you did. And so after that, you print it out, you, you, you do some design, right? So you're either going to design it yourself. You can use ExoCAD or Blue Sky or whatever you want. Um, check out True Abutment's um, Dentrue software. It's a free software, free, free, like no, no way, you know, no exports, just totally free. And then print it out. We're going to print it out in one color, right? So that in this case, we're doing an A3 and then paint the gums on. And that's all there is to it. All right. So I'm going to stop the share. Great. Thank all you. Right. That helps you, Dr. Pitts. 
uh, that thorough explanation. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Uh, Dean, Dr. Ron Dean. Can you share your protocol for digital dentures for an endontulous patient without existing dentures? Uh, okay, so that's tougher, right? So patient's got no denture, right? So go to um, themodinstitute.com. Um, actually, I tell you what, uh, if you guys want, I'll share my screen and show you where it is, and then I'll put it in the chat. So let me go to share screen. And uh, can you guys see uh, see my screen share? You guys can see it. So let's go to themodinstitute.com. And let's see, free resources. And so let's see, STL downloads. Here it is. So this thing is so awesome. So this is uh, Wally invented this. And basically, it's like a box plane with this little bike thing. And so what Wally does, and you can actually, there's a video um, here on how to do it. So it'll, it'll show you how to do it. But basically, where to go? Let's just click on that. Uh, yeah, there's a video on how to do it. And so basically, you 3D print this thing. And so basically, what you're going to do is scan the patient's gums, right? So you're going to do intraoral scanning of the patient's gums. Now, I've always kind of poo pooed that um, because we can't capture the borders very well. But what you can do is if you scan the patient's gums and use this to get the vertical and use this to get the patient's bite, you can at least get something, right? You can get a denture, which may be overextended or underextended. But let's say you do all this and you design a denture and it's, you know, overextended or over, uh, underextended. Well, in that time, you've got a set of dentures, right? Then you can take an impression, then you can scan the impression. So I'm not going to talk too much about this because this is Wally's jam, but uh, let me go ahead and copy this link. And let me put it in the chat. So let me stop the share. Um, let's see, let's go to everyone. Hmm. I can only see host and panelists. Um, I'm gonna do this. Could you share that with everyone else? I don't think I have the option to share with everyone. I think I can. Uh, yes, let me just see if it's coming up. Hmm. Oh, it's on the Q and A. Sorry. Oh, it is there. Okay, great. Yeah. Let me. Um, so, Ron, I'm going to put a link to Ron's. Perfect. And then everyone can it see it. There. So again, sorry for giving you a non-answer. I've, I've actually never done this myself, <laughs> um, but uh, Wally does it like on the daily. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Donna Pitts wanted to thank you for your for your previous answer. So just wanted to let you know that. We have another anonymous question. Are there free or inexpensive design software programs you can recommend or definitive crown and custom temporary slash wax up design? Yeah, so um, I can suggest them. Um, I don't love them, to be honest with you. Um, you can use Blue Sky. So Blue Sky Bio um, has, you can make crowns with that um, and you can do wax ups in Blue Sky Bio. Um, it's not bad um, it's great for free, um, but it's not as good as let's say Three Shape or um, ExoCAD. Um, actually, you know what? I forgot my, I didn't get to my slide on designers. Can I show you my slide on designers? Is that cool? That's cool. So um, let me give you a, a different option. So, uh, oh, I didn't talk about my courses. Um, okay. So you got a couple options, right? So if you want to, um, the best, best software, in my opinion, for design is ExoCAD. But ExoCAD is expensive. It's going to probably run you like 11 or 12 grand. And I think three shapes probably close to that or seven or eight grand. Uh, but Blue Sky Bio is free. 
Um, there's one called Clinix, which is uh, distributed by Cadre. I think it's a hundred bucks a month. It's not bad. Um, also, Medit just released their ShareSide uh, Clinic CAD. Um, so that's Medit, um, and that's free. Um, I tried to design an inlay with it, and it looked like like really bad. <laughs> um, so, so if you want to design yourself um, and you want it to be free, uh, then try you know a Medit uh, ShareSide CAD or Blue Sky Bio. Um, Clinics is a little. Uh, you know, it's a hundred bucks a month. Uh, but if you really want a good design software, it's ExoCAD. Um, however, um, can you guys see that or, or is the chat box in the way? Is the chat box in the way or, or no? Are you seeing full screen? I don't know if it is. I can't really use my mouse. Um, so We're anyway. seeing full screen. You see full screen, you see the people in the middle? See so, people. yeah, so so if you're a newbie, um, using a designer is a really good idea. And designers are really cheap. And so if you guys are on Facebook, write down the name Lee Kiki. And so it's spelled L-I and then a space, then Q-I-Q-I. -I. And so she's on Facebook. Um, she's a designer out of Taipei. And she charges like nothing. She charges like five bucks a tooth for design. And she usually gets you the design within 24 hours. And so again, it's Lee Kiki. Um, if you look at the picture, I can't see it because my Q&A box is stuck over it. But there's a lot of like catfishers out there. So Lee Kiki is the implant bridge. And so hit her up and she does incredible designs. Um, Daniel Portal is a US US based ExoCAD uh, person. He's amazing. Um, I think he charges about 15 a unit. Um, the cool thing about Daniel Portal, and he's on Facebook too, uh, Daniel um, will be on call for you. Um, you can just say, hey, I got a case at 11. Um, I want you to like design it real quick and then send it to me so I can print it. And he'll do it like on the fly. And then Gus Colley um, just does hybrids. He charges 300 bucks an arch, um, and it's amazing. Um, he, he does the most beautiful hybrids out there. And so I don't design my own hybrids. I can do anything else. Um, the other thing that's really getting popular is AI-based cloud design. And so there's a bunch of different companies out there. Three Shape does it, Sprint Ray does it, and Alien does it, um, Alien Milling. It's okay. Um, the AI stuff is a little not great, um, but with AI, pretty soon you won't have to worry about design. It, it is going to get better, uh, but those are the options. And so I'll go ahead and stop the share here. And I can't Fascinating, wait. thank you. Yeah. Um, I but if you want to learn design, uh, go to themodinstitute.com and come on over to mod west which i teach it so let me just see if i can get out of there okay now i can do it so stop and share all right cool there we go sorry thank you very much and i added um the name there to the mod in the link to the mod institute as well as the designer out of taipei uh, who could you reach me yeah yeah lee kiki thank you um okay so let me just go on to this next uh Question from Dr. Pescatore, Dr. Christopher Pescatore. You said that it costs twenty dollars for the denture, I think, but that is just the material cost. What would be the total cost? Yeah, good crash. Uh, good question, Christopher. So um, when you uh, when I said twenty bucks, um, I was using True Abutment's Dentru software, which is free. There's like no export fees involved. So the 20 bucks is for the entire denture. That's all the resin. Um, I guess I'm not factoring in how long it took my dental assistant to characterize it or to assemble it. Um, but yeah, it was 20 bucks for the resin cost. There's no export in True Abutment's Dentru software. If you want it designed, um, I think uh, Lee Kiki charges 70 bucks for a set. Um, 
and so uh, 35 in Arch, and I think Sprint Ray charges the same. Great, thank you. Uh, and this question is from Dr. Ad Adeji. Adedeji, if the video if the video needs to be increased, how do you do the bite at what video you want? At the video well, that you want. Yeah, if, if you're talking about dentures, um, typically uh, what I would do, I guess, in that case would be to add some composite to the denture and then take the bite with the composite on the denture. But if you know, if you're making a denture and it's only costing you 20 bucks, you can also just tell the designer um, that they have these digital articulators within ExoCAD or FreeShape, and they can raise the pin by how much you want. And so I think they say one millimeter in the posterior is three millimeters in the anterior. Um, so, you know, tell the, the designer, hey, I want you to design me one with one millimeter um, in the anterior open and then do another one for me at three millimeters of the open and then try them in. Like, don't even characterize them, just stick them in the patient's mouth and see what video they can stand, right? And then that also goes true with crown and bridge. So if let's say you're doing a wax up and you wanna open the patient up, well, just like your lab would open the patient up on an articulator, the ExoCAD designer can open up your patient on the articulator you can 3D print the temporaries, you can stick them in the patient's mouth and the patient says, whoa, that's just way too open. Okay, then you go back to design to design it with the, the lower. Thank you, Dr. De Oliveira. And uh, Dr. Pescatori thanks you as well um, for the previous answer. Okay, and the last question that we have here is from Dr. Dean, Ron Dean. What product do you recommend to stain the gingival tissues, gingival tissues in a monolithic printed denture? Yeah, so a, a lot of people have their faves. Um, I like um, OptiGlaze Opti um, by GC, um, so Opti Space Glaze. Um, and um, OptiGlaze comes in lots of different colors. Don't buy the full-on kit. Um, so buy like red, pink, I think there's like a red brown um, by um, lavender um, for incisal edges. Um, but if you want to stain the teeth, um, I recommend uh, Ampress Direct um, composite glazes from Ivaclar. So they got like brown and they have incisal and they have honey and they have all these different ones. Um, but Opi Glaze is gonna be for the, the pink part and um, Empress Direct um, for the uh, occlusals and the gingivals. Thank you. Um, thank you with three exclamation marks, with four exclamation marks from Dr. Right. Rondine and uh, also from Dr. Adedeji. Thank you for the answer that helps, says Dr. Adedeji. Cool. Well, Thank you, everybody, um, for all of your questions tonight. And thank you, Dr. De Oliveira, for a wonderful presentation this evening. Thank, thank you for me. joining us tonight. And we did record tonight's webinar and we'll be emailing the recording out sometime in the next week. We would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. Thank you, everybody, again, for joining us. And we look forward uh, to seeing you on future webinars. That was really great. Thank you, Dr. Oliveira. Thanks, guys. See ya. Well, bye-bye. Good All night, right, everybody. Bye.